starting. This and meeting I'm, is being recorded. I'm going to go to Facebook and um, press the live button. There we go. Right. I always want something to happen on my end so that, okay, <laughs> Facebook is streaming. Got it. Thank All right. You. I want to welcome everybody who's watching in our Facebook group as well as um, any visitors that are also watching here today. And we have, we hosted Jenny a week ago and she uh, shared a lot of great information <laughs> and and today she's going to be uh, talking more about um, behavior, I think behavior related things. And I really can't speak into that. I don't have any kind of background in that at all. So uh, Sherry, do you want to say anything before Jenny begins? Um, well, I'm just really excited to talk about this topic because it's a, it's a topic that I feel like all of us have times where we're like I just need some resources like I need some help what there's got to be a better way to to you know to do this whatever it is with my child like for me potty training I was talking about that yesterday was uh, so challenging or like the sleep thing having my little one you know they tell you not to let your little one sleep with you but I did like one week and then I felt like I paid for it the next two years, you know, <laughs> and, and things like that. Um, so I think we all need strategies and resources for that. So I'm really excited to find out, learn more about all of this. Wow, well, fantastic. Yeah. I'm super excited to be here. Thank you guys for inviting me back. Um, so first of all, I want to say, um, well, this, this is interesting. So this conversation, this topic today is absolutely massive. So today's going to be a little bit of introduction, a little bit of thinking out loud and kind of bouncing some ideas off of each other. Um, it is not Jenny's way or the highway. It's not Jenny's way is the best way. It's not ABA is everybody's best way either. Um, so as a behavior analyst, and I'll go into that in a minute, my job is to help parents, because that's who we're talking to today, is help parents find options to move in the direction of the better behavior that they want. It's not all black and white. It's not all going to work for everybody. So I'm just going to put that little disclaimer out there. This is not Jenny's best answer to parenting 101. <laughs> it's to help us think about options that'll move us in the direction that you guys as parents, who I believe are your child's best advocate, best expert, always right. I, it's, it's the parents who have this stuff down pat. And then sometimes as parents, you guys go, yeah, but I'd like it to run a little more smoothly. Can you give me some suggestions? And then I come along or my team comes along and we go, yeah, we'd love to brainstorm this with you. We'd love to give you some more suggestions. We'd love to see what fits your family and what fits your values and what fits your end goal. Um, and so I think that's something that even before we really get into what is a behavior analyst that I would love to talk, um, Sherry and Rosemary and Lily, if you're willing to throw some ideas out there, because I don't know your parents really well who are, who are in your Empowered um, Homeschooling Families group. But if you had to give me, you know, like your top three or four or even five values, right? Why do we homeschool? What, what, what do we want to get out of this? Why is this so important to us? Why have we taken on this massive undertaking? What, what would you say are maybe some of those top two or three or even four values of your families? Do you have a thought on that? Well, I can speak, uh, I can say something. So one of the students that I'm homeschooling, I'm not homeschooling, um, working with, he is 14 now, and when I started working with him, he's 13, and um, he couldn't read yet. So he was just being pushed through because he really needed, uh, he has like severe dyslexia, and he, uh, the teachers couldn't work that much with him one-on-one, -on -one. so he's being pushed through. So this coming fall, his mother, his 
parents are not going to put them back in school. So yeah. that might be a reason for many homeschooling families. Their kids don't fit in and maybe their needs aren't being met. Okay. So the, the value is maybe as the parent to preserve the parent-child relationship and foster relationships well with other people so that they're not always feeling like I'm the kid who can't do it, right? Maybe a value would be to foster some independence in that child, foster a love of learning again. It sounds like that kiddo might be really frustrated with school. He was. Right? Um, persistence oh my gosh if this if the student's 14 or whatever he's been persisting for a long time but is he feeling defeated or is he feeling hopeful um and so in all of that yes there's a skill of learning to read right a skill of overcoming dyslexia a skill of gaining some knowledge in that but it sounds like these parents have some other values along the way that are saying that's why i'm i mom dad that's why we're the best ones to try and do this Sherry, you have any other values you can think of with, with your families? I think also like their, their moral beliefs, they may be frustrated with what is being taught in, in the uh, mm -hmm. school systems, depending on where mm -hmm. they live and, and everything. So there are moral issues that that they want to be able to control what is what their kids are being introduced to and when and in yeah. what manner right back to that idea that parent knows best right really and and that needs to be honored and um sherry that was in one of the little comments that that you made when we were talking about what are we going to talk about today that um society today is saying you know as parents we don't know best school knows best, government knows best, we can't discipline our kids, we're just supposed to be their friends and it's all gonna be great and the school's gonna take care of it. Well, that's, that's not what I'm hearing, the common value of some of your, your families. So why is that important? In behavior analysis, so now, let's, now that I have an idea of, of who my audience is, whether they're here today or they're watching this, this video later, um, Let's talk a little bit about what behavior analysis is and why that might be important or helpful to your families. So as a behavior analyst, when people say, what do you do? I say, I change behavior. And then they go, ooh, are you assessing me, right? Are you looking at what I'm doing? Do you see something I need to change? And then my quick answer is, no, no, no. Are you paying me? And they go, no. And I go, well, I don't work unless I get paid. And that lets everybody relax a little bit. And no, Jenny's not, you know, eyeing you up one side and down the other. But that's what a behavior analyst does. A behavior analyst will come into any situation, any environment, any location with any humans. Some work with animals, but that's not my thing, right? So with any group of humans or singular human, and ask somebody, wow, what is it that you need to change, right? What would you like for someone to be able to do better? Or what would you like for someone to do less of? And then we use our really cool learning strategies, our science of applied behavior and, and applied behavior analysis, and we help you move towards that goal. Now, the reason I asked about values is because some behavior analysts are very skill driven, right? I want my kid to do math. Great, I can come in and I can teach your kid to do math in two sessions, right? So long as I know what the math is, right? Or I want my kiddo to, to sit down and do something and read. And I go, great. And I go, hey, Sherry, what's that skill they need to learn? And I can use my science to go in and help engineer the environment to support learning that skill. I can get results, right? And I've been a speech pathologist for 30 years, a behavior analyst for 15. And early on in my career, I was all about skills and results. But what I have learned and what has changed in the past 10 to 12 years is that I'm really more about helping parents move towards their values than a given skill set. Because parents will feel more successful, more relaxed, more engaged. You'll get more buy-in when you're moving towards their values than when you're saying, well, wow, your kid can add now. Woohoo. Um, and so that's why I asked about values. Because oftentimes um, parents come to me and say, my kid is fill in the blank and I don't like it. I need it to stop. 
right? Why does my kid do that? And I put my skills to work and we say, well, what's happening before? What's happening after? What do you think they get out of it? Why do you think they're doing it? And really after just a couple of questions, I can see some light bulbs going on that the parents like, oh, they don't wanna do their schoolwork. Or, oh, they wanna get back to video game time or outside or, oh, they're really missing dad or mom who had to go to work today. And so they're kind of feeling alone and, and left out, right? And so I can pretty quickly kind of find out why something might be happening. That's really the easier part of my job. The hard part is helping parents understand that they really have a lot of choice in how they move in the direction of their values. Um, I'm not a sit at the table and learn kind of person, right? If, if we narrow down values to what are Jenny's personal values when it comes to learning, um, creativity and discovery is high on my list. Fun, right? I wanna have fun when I'm learning because when I'm not having fun, and I hate learning and it's drudgery, then I avoid my desk and I avoid my textbooks and I avoid that report that I have to learn. But when I can look at it from a fun discovery, creative, how can I do this point of view, then that engages me. So, so that's a high value of mine. Um, relationship is another super high value. So when it comes to learning, I don't like to learn alone, <laughs> right? Just letting you see a little bit of Jenny today. I like to learn with somebody. And not 500 people sitting in an auditorium. College was not a huge success for me on some levels. I like stuff like this, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, maybe a group of three. Let's brainstorm. Let's learn together. I'm going to help you. You're going to help me. I'm going to go, yay, Sherry, that was really cool. And you're going to say, yay, Jenny, that was great. And then you're going to say, Jenny, that was kind of silly. Let's talk that one out, right? And I'll say, yay, Rosemary. Wow, I never thought about that. And so I love that relationship building side of learning that our kids don't get in a classroom of 35 with a teacher up front disseminating information and our kids just kind of have to grab it as it flies by. So in a traditional schoolroom, the creativity throughout the day is really relegated to small little chunks. And the relationship is really relegated to small little chunks. Basically it's recess. Last time I worked in a school, we had a noise monitor in the cafeteria right? You can't even talk at lunch. What is that? Right? Anyway, another soapbox for another day. Um, so when, when I start writing programs, right, parent comes to me and says, my kiddo doesn't like school anymore. Every time we say it's time for school, they run out of the room or they're on the floor having a temper tantrum or they're shredding books or whatever. And we go through that process and we try and figure out why is that happening? Right? Is it too hard? Is the chair uncomfortable? Do they miss their video game? Do they miss mom or dad who had to go to work, right? And then we say, okay, well, if, if it's too hard, how do we teach them a skill to make it better? Or how do we back off on the level of skill that we're trying to teach so that we can get some success? And if we can figure out that sweet spot where it's a little bit challenging and we're making some progress, but it's not so hard that they're avoiding us, then we have all this room for creativity and for relationship and for all of those other fun things about learning to come back into the picture. I know, really long answer. So to come, to come back to, to my point is that I want parents to tell me as much about their values as I do about the skills that their kiddo can or cannot do. Because then when I say, well, how about doing this? right? Or your friend looks at you and says, well, you can't tell your child that. And you're like, oh, really? I can't? I'm going to say, is whatever this thing is that you're trying to do, is that moving you in the direction of your values? Or is that moving away from your values? And if it's moving you away from your values, then I'm going to say, hey, tell Jenny, don't do that. We can need to rethink this because that's not where my family goes when it comes to learning. That's not where my family goes when it comes to bedtime. That's not where my family goes when it comes to mealtime. So if you want to help my kiddo and my family do better in those areas, bedtime, mealtime, bath time, getting dressed, chores, learning, any of those things, you've got to do it within the scope of moving in the direction of our family's values. 
Otherwise, it's no good for anybody. So that was a really long answer to what does a, a behavior analyst kind of do, but we change behavior, but more than change behavior, we try to change behavior in a way that preserves and honors and supports the values of the family. Awesome. Did you like that little answer? <laughs> yes, that's great. And, and mm -hmm. I it, it, totally unexpected. I, 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 had in my head kind of what I, you know, we all have ideas of what a, a direction that we expect things to go. And, mm -hmm. and um, you definitely took it in a different way. So let's see. Hey, I never, I never expected as well to um, uh, take a look at family values. So mm. yes, yeah, something new for me. Yeah. yeah. And how to, you know, we often, we can, even, even as you're saying this, I'm going, okay, well, so if my kid's not eating his, if my son doesn't like anything except macaroni and cheese because he has sensory processing disorder and everything else is, is, um, is bothers his palate or whatever. And he only, you know, that's the only thing he likes. Mm -hmm. But my family value system is to have dinner time be a social time, but my son takes 10 million years to eat. <laughs> so then I'm having to compromise my family values for my son who needs to, who I need to keep him going. You know, that is an actual real, uh, a real challenge thing. that my husband and I have had because my husband's like, no more talking, just eat you know, because he'll sit there for 10 million years. At the same time, I'm going, well, wait a second, we need to connect. This is connection time, you know, right. and all that can be super challenging in that respect. Yes, I love that example, Sherry, because as a behavior analyst, we would come in and we would write you this wonderful program on how to get your kiddo to tolerate other foods other than macaroni and cheese. Or we would write your kiddo this wonderful program on how to shut up and eat instead of spending all your time talking, right? And those are valid things. We could really do that. Um, but would those be moving you in the direction of your family values? And so you'd say, well, no, really, I want this to be social time. So then we have to step back and talk to mom and dad about, okay, first of all, are we both on board with the, the value, the goal of dinner time being family connect time? And if it's not our primary nutritional time, how and when do we address that? And then we start saying, well, yeah, now let's brainstorm some other ideas because your kid does need some nutrition, right? So, so when and how do we help that happen? Um, and I can tell you, I have some 10, 12 year olds in my caseload that still only eat macaroni and cheese or cheese and rice, right? My little Hispanic family kiddos. And, and it was a miracle day when we got this kiddo off of chicken nuggets and he could go with his family out to the restaurant um, while mom and dad were eating and, and having some of their social time. And he actually ate chicken and rice and didn't have to have or cheese and rice, rice and cheese. There you go, rice and cheese. Didn't have to have chicken nuggets at the Mexican restaurant, right? Because now their family was like, oh yeah, this is what we eat. We eat rice and cheese, right? Um, and, and it was really cool. And you know what? The kids, 12 or 13, maybe he's 14. I, I don't know. They grow up way so fast, don't they? And he's thriving. And you know what his diet is? Chicken nuggets and rice and cheese. And he's okay. He's really okay. He can go out, he can go to restaurants, he can go to parties, he can eat at home with his family. His nutrition is meh, okay. He does willingly eat a vitamin here, there, or the other, or he drinks a Pedialyte, which again, maybe this is not your favorite idea of nutrition, but when I talked to the family and I said, well, what's more important to you, having this wide variety of nutrition and eating sushi or having family time where your family can go to family events and dinner out and parties and, and even school lunch some days. And they said, you know, the social is much more important than having a hundred things that he's willing to eat. And I had to say, okay, because the parents know best. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. It really makes your brain go, mm, mm. 
<laughs> and then your neighbors or your siblings, right, who also have 10 and 12 year old kids who eat a thousand things, including sushi, are going to say, but no. And then we get into PSAs, public service announcements, right? And I'm all for parents being um, the best advocate for their family and the best advocate for their kiddos. And so early on, we start talking about public service announcements, whether it's, you know, what do you say as a mom of a, a two-year-old, maybe with autism who does not talk well and trips to the grocery store can really be rough. And sometimes there's a big tantrum and sometimes you've got to leave your cart and walk away. What do you say so that you don't feel like really the, the, you know, totally inadequate parent in the middle of the grocery store with your kiddo. And so we talk public service announcements um, and we practice them together, right? Oh man, I am so glad I'm in a community that cares about my family and my kiddo so much that you're interested in what's going on with us right now. And I'm so glad that I have a grocery store that, you know, even though I'm struggling with my kiddo who has autism and today's not one of his best days that you guys are going to let me leave my cart here and, and I'll be back in 30 minutes, maybe, or I'll send his dad or somebody and come get the groceries. And wow, thank you for being so understanding and pick up your kid and walk away <laughs> kind of thing. But if the parent doesn't practice that and doesn't know how to say that and invite their community into being welcoming and supportive, then it's ooh, bad parent and call CPS because you're abusing your kiddo. But it's because they have no information. But whose job is it to provide the information? Unfortunately, it's that parent who's having a really hard time right then. Um, wow. And so, you know, same thing when you're at a birthday party and they're serving hot dogs and you show up with cheese and rice and your sibling looks at you and says, Sherry, really, again, your kid won't even eat a hot dog? Come on. I thought this year would be the year that, you know, fill in the blank. And you go, wow, I'm just so thankful that I have siblings, you know, that let my kid come and let him feel like he's part of the crew, even though we're eating cheese and rice today. And you don't, you know, you just, you just love us. So thank you for, you know, walking with our family through this, but you've got to be able to say it. So you don't sound sarcastic, right? Even though you're feeling sarcastic. <laughs> right, right. Even though it's like, come on, dude. And at another time, there probably is a place for that come on, dude, conversation. It's like, look, and it's that family values conversation. Your family values sushi and my family values being able to attend your party. Because if I couldn't attend your party, if we had to eat sushi, but attending is more important than whether or not I eat rice and cheese or I eat sushi. Right. So true. Even like Thanksgiving, I'm thinking of like a family Thanksgiving dinner when some people are like, oh, we have to have the traditional Thanksgiving dinner and we have to have this menu. And then the other people are going, but our kids don't like that. So what yeah. do we do? You know, do we really have to have the traditional Thanksgiving dinner or is, is it more about the food that we eat or is it more about the time that we have together? Right. Is it more about the skill that we learn? Two plus two is four or five, depending on where you go to school, right? Two plus two is four. Or is it more about loving learning and being creative in how we learn and wanting to show up for school? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So let, let's talk environment a little bit because there are two, the, I don't want to say we're oppositional. That's not, that's not a good word, but the two kind of different ends of the spectrum of behavior change. One is the field of psychology that says change comes from within you. If you think about it enough, you can change what you do. And the other end of that is behavior analysis that says behavior is going to change when the environment changes. And if we can change the environment, then even if I can't think about how to change, change can still happen. So let me give you an example of that. When we're outside, and it's 100 degrees, I don't necessarily need somebody to tell me to take off my jacket, right? The environment has changed. It was cold when I left this morning and I went for a walk on my girlfriend on West Cliff. We're out on, on the ocean and it's beautiful. It's a little chilly. The breeze is blowing and about two miles into our walk, I'm sweating. It is now hot. The sun is on full bore. There's no more breeze coming off the ocean and I am dressed for winter still because Jenny doesn't like to be cold right? The environment changed. But I know all I got to do is take off my jacket and my sweatshirt and, you know, tie it around my waist and drink more water. 
because the environment changed, my behavior changed. I didn't really have to have this long introspective thing on should I or can I or is that better or should I not or what's the benefit of or how will that get me, right? The environment changed, so my behavior changed. And so again, when I'm working with parents, um, especially when it comes to learning, but really about anything, if I'm working with a parent, oftentimes by the time folks get to me, they're really frustrated and they want me to come in and fix it. And especially fix the little kiddo because the kiddo's in distress, which makes mom in distress, which makes all learning stop, right? And so come in and fix my kiddo and then we'll get back to learning and things will be okay. And I come in and I say, wow, that's not really what I do. The person that I work with is typically the adult and I help the adult change the environment and do some things differently so that the student can come back to being happy, creative, engaged, relaxed, purposeful, and not in distress. And the parents, often it's teachers, right? Because I work in schools, teachers go, but I don't have time to do that because I have to make the learning happen. Mm -hmm. Right now, you guys have homeschool families. And so if there are multiple siblings, sometimes I hear the same thing. Oh, well, I can't do all of that because I have the siblings who have to keep learning. And then I bring them back to their values. And I say, well, is your values that he learns the skill or is your value that relationship is maintained? Is your value that school stays fun? Is your value that learning is creative? And so if none of those values are being addressed, let's take a look at what we can do in the environment to keep those things going. Let's sit on the floor and learn. Let's have the wooby wrapped around our legs, right? Our blankie, whatever that is. Let's have, I mean, <laughs> I have a heater pad on my chair that is on 365 days a year. It's just what makes Jenny go to her happy place right? It's that warm snuggly that if I could, I'd be sitting next to someone, right? I told you I like to learn with someone, but all my learning is virtual. My kiddos are on the other side of the screen. My parents are on the other side of the screen. So there's something about that warm, fuzzy heater pad, whether it's on my back or it's on my lap or it's wrapped around my ankles, that kind of makes my learning environment a better place for learning. Now, is it teaching me anything in a skill? No, but it makes me ready for learning. Um, and so, you know, we spend a lot of time talking to parents about how do we, or what can we change up in the environment that moves you closer to, towards those values and also helps bring better behavior. Um, I don't care if the kiddo wants to walk around and read their book to me, right? Yeah. Are, are they reading? Sure, that's great. Um, okay. I'm not big on background noise, so I don't prefer music being on in the background, but I do have some students learn better with that little bit of, of noise in the background. And Jenny's had to learn to address or to adjust, right? Because it's not my way or the highway. My value is relationship. My value is learning together. My value is stay engaged. And so if it takes a little bit of music in the background to do that, or a puppy dog on their lap, or snack time one more time, especially when I'm a speech therapist, right? And I'm trying to do sounds and they've got a mouthful of Cheetos and I'm like, <laughs> but I go back to my values, right? I want learning to be fun. I want learning to be relational. I want learning to be creative. So how do we use Cheetos and snack times to build that and be part of what we're doing instead of trying to make that go away? And so when parents, and I loved, you know, empowered homeschool families, when parents can feel empowered that the way their student likes to learn is okay, and we can use that as a foundational strength and jumping off place, then behavior change becomes much more easy, much more easy. So yeah. true. Yeah. Definitely. So what do you has everything to do with with growth like uh, yeah. and our receptivity to growing like our brains just completely open up when we feel capable and it's yes with, like reading for you know like reading is is another example if we put if all we if all we focus on is the individual words then kids don't feel like kids who especially kids with like dyslexia or things like that um, don't feel um, 
don't feel capable, but if we can get them in a book that is e simple enough that mm -hmm. even if it has repetitive words and all of that, and we can get them to see themselves as readers, that's the first step in them becoming readers is them being able to see, see that, see themselves. Yeah, that way. yeah absolutely. So let's talk for a minute about some other maybe environmental supports or, or tweaks that, that a parent can do maybe to quickly see um, some added levels of support and then perhaps start seeing some behavior change, okay. right? I have so, just one little comment. Yeah. If I can just insert it. So I liked that last part that you were talking about, um, including family, you know, looking at family values and looking at your child and how they're different because I think oftentimes as parents, like we were, we were trained, we were taught, you know, a certain way with certain values and certain ways of thinking. And so we think we have, this is, this is the way that we're going to teach our own children. And so we're not, we're not flexible. And so mm -hmm. um, seeing, realizing that oh, it's okay if my child only wants to eat mac and cheese and he's not eating his vegetables every day, you know, but it's yeah. okay, you know? And so if we can like, learn to like um and but realize then when you when when it's not just like you're not just like giving in and letting the the kid rule you know it's something different but it's going to allow um family values to take place and it's going to allow your child to grow so um i really liked how you talked about looking at what your family values are it helps the parent to realize that they don't have to be stuck in a certain way of thinking and doing things. So, and, and I can look back on me as a parent and see, you know, like certain things that I never expected with, with the boys and um, yeah. And, and having to kind of figure things out, you know, so. Yeah, that's, that's, that's beautiful because as parents, we're taught to have our kids follow the rules. I mean, as humans, we're taught to follow the rules, right? Follow the speed limit, show up on time, do your job, right? Follow all the rules. We are supposed to follow rules. And that's okay, right? That keeps organization in, in our um, communities, in our families, in our schools, in our whatever. So I'm, I'm okay with rules. I actually love rules myself for myself, right? Um, but to know that we have that flexibility and that rules that are not laws for the safety of others really can be changed. So if the rule is eat a square meal, right? The whatever is the latest pyramid or my plate or my whatever. So the rule is, you know, seven servings of fruits and vegetables a day. I'm like, dude, I'm 56 years old and I eat maybe one. I'm obviously not malnourished or, or unhealthy or, you know, anything. Um, but I don't, I don't eat that. So that's a rule that I'm okay making a new rule for, right? And so maybe my rule is that I want to try and eat one fruit or vegetable a day. And when I make it, I give myself a pat on the back and I'm pretty darn cool with that, right? So letting our parents or empowering or championing our parents to figure out how those maybe cultural or societal rules can be changed to better fit where they're trying to get their student to love that. Yeah. Love that. And that does take flexibility and that does take support. Yeah. 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 I agree with you so much. And you think about so many of the value things that we have, like the, the, the rules on, on, you know, when we were growing up, how many grains, servings of grains you could ha you were supposed to have, the recommended amount of grains when we were kids versus yeah. what it is now and what now. my plate looks like because mm -hmm. my son is earning the cooking merit badge in Boy Scouts. <laughs> and it's like crazy the difference. Yes. And, and we took that as this is the standard. This is the way mm -hmm. it's supposed to be. And, and I think every new season has a new way of thinking so we need to give ourselves permission to go you know what i'm okay with not doing it that way i mean another example is 
the whole SIDS epidemic. You know, when I was when I was mm-hmm. growing up, my um, my siblings slept on their stomachs, right? Mm-hmm. Well, so then of course, when I had my son, you have to have him on his back. Well, he screamed and he woke up constantly, constantly. Yeah. He would not sleep that way. The second I put him on his stomach, out like a light and he was fine. And yeah. yet, you know, of course, then I'm like, I'm a terrible parent because I'm letting him lay on his stomach. What if he dies in a sleep, da, 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 you know, all of that. Yeah. But the reality of it is, what about all the kids who slept on their stomachs before, you know, sleeping on your back was the thing to do, you know? Right. <laughs> or, or right. All the nursing, you know, th- then there was the whole stage where it was like, everybody nurses. And then it was no nursing is not good for your kids. You should feed them with a bottle and feed them formula that's better for babies. And then now it's back to nursing again. Yeah. It's just constantly, we just have to give ourselves permission to yeah. to, to ha- make the choices that are right for our family and what we yes. believe in. Yes. Do you know why Baskin Robbins has 31 flavors? Because everyone's it's, different. <laughs> right. Because not everybody likes every flavor. Right. And it's just like, okay, well, that's like really simple and, and kind of dumb, Jenny. But it really is the truth at the heart of the matter is that we all are different and our families all are different. And maybe what's a priority in my family might not be a priority in your family. But if, again, as the specialist who comes in, the behavior analyst, when you tell me that your family's having a little bit of a struggle, my priority is to figure out which flavor your family likes, which flavor your family prefers, so that I can guide all of my interventions that I'm going to recommend in a direction that's going to line up with where you want to be at the end of the day. Yeah. True. Yeah. So back to environmental supports, <laughs> right? Um, so let's just say you have a kiddo that mom says, I can't get him to pay attention, right? Can't, can't start on problem number one and get to problem number 10 or whatever, you know, whatever the reason is. And again, these are just going to be some really generic examples um, because I don't know all of the details. Um, but sometimes kiddos with that, can't pay attention, it's kind of an overflow of too much energy, right? When recess went away, nine out of 10 kids became ADHD, right? And it's like, no, we just got to go run around. So sometimes an environmental change for kids who can't focus and don't have really good attention is get rid of distractions. Another one might be to add some background noise or to add something that does like that white noise in the background that kind of takes a level of everything else off and, and brings something down. Another thing might be to exercise for five minutes. I didn't know what brain break was until, this is a YouTube thing, right? Until a couple of years ago when I had one of my students who was also a special ed teacher. And she's like, Jenny, you know, about every 30 minutes we stop doing what we're doing and we do a brain break. And I'm like, what does that mean? And she's like, it's my answer to all the fidgetiness. And you can go to YouTube if you don't know what that is. And you just type in brain break. And it's this little exercise thing that that you can find in 5,000 flavors um, that your kiddo can do. And they're usually about five minutes. Um, and they're fun. But it gets your kid up and moving and focused on the screen and participating, whatever. For some kiddos, that kind of primes their brain, primes their body, gets them focused because I'm listening to what this thing's saying, I'm looking and I'm following with what's going on, and then they can sit down and learn, whatever it is. But that could be a nice environmental change for a kiddo who needs some help with focus and attention. Um, earphones, right? Earphones could be a really nice environmental modification. It has nothing to do with whether they can hear or not hear, but as mom or teacher, when I give an instruction, I kind of want it to go right here <laughs> instead of out into the, the universe where my kids got to grab it and find it and pop it in his ears. Well, let's just kind of help them, right? Um, and, and stick it right there. Visuals. Visuals, 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 right? So a visual timer. How long do I have to work? Visuals with a highlighter separating the lines of problems. Visuals with a ruler that can take line by line by line what I'm reading visual that has 
either pictures or words written down for the three tasks, activities, exercises that we're supposed to do today. Visuals are amazing for helping kiddos, all kiddos, I think, but especially kiddos with some focus and attention, know where they're supposed to come back to, right? So if I'm reading and I look over there and I come back, if I don't have that ruler as a visual, then I'm like, where did I lose my place on that, that page, right? Mm -hmm. Or if I'm you know, I finished one activity and mom has to step out of the room to go help his sibling. And I'm like, well, what am I supposed to do next? Well, if I have those three little things on a picture or a board, a dry erase, then I can go right back to that and go, oh, that one's done. Here's the next one, right? And spelling may be the letter A and math may be the plus sign and PE may be, um, I don't know, Popeye or something, right? And so there can be pictures as well as, as words for our folks that are not good readers yet. But visuals can be super, super helpful um, for engineering the environment to support our kiddos. Um, yes, what other kind especially of especially being able to take off, like if you have all your tasks yeah. on a board with Velcro st strips and laminated, yeah. and they can take physically take off their task as they complete it, or they can take the all the tasks from somewhere else and stick them on, and when the mm -hmm. whole thing is cut is full, then they know they're finished for the day. It helps them to right. see that time is going away. And that absolutely less to do. And sometimes if it's a get up and move and go to the the list, the schedule, or if you can get some of that industrial strike strength Velcro where it's eh, now we're adding movement to it. And so our kids again that need just that little bit of regrouping can get up and in three minutes of movement and working on pulling this thing apart and stuffing it in a thing and pulling out the next one and pulling it apart and sticking it up there and pushing it on the wall, that little bit of movement can be an amazing kind of refocus time before they have to go back and sit down for the next 15 minute activity. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, lots of different environmental things that can really help support Another massive environmental support for me that goes along with the visuals is choices. Um, so, you know, as the therapist, I want to come in and say, we're going to do one, two, three, four, five. And I want to start at the beginning and I want to work to the end. And I, again, I've learned through the years that that's nice rule governed thinking. And I'm all about task completion. But is it in line with creativity? Is it in line with relationship? Is it in line with independent learning? Is it in line with persistence? No, it's just following somebody else's rule. So now it's like, okay, here are the five things that I think we need to get done. Here are the five things that you like. Today, I get to pick four things. You get to pick two things, okay? I want to start today and tomorrow will be your day to start. So the first one is this. What do you want to do next? and they can pick one. And what do I wanna do next? And I pick one and what do they wanna do next? And we make our schedule together where we're doing relationship and we're letting them bring some of their fun stuff in. And then where I can, I try to see if we can do what we're doing without following the rules, right? So the math paper, you're supposed to start at number one and do number two and do number three and do number four all the way to 25. What if the rule said, pick any seven, right? What's your favorite number today? Oh, seven's your favorite number. Oh, pick your favorite seven and let's do those seven. Ready, set, go. And so they take that highlighter and they circle seven problems. They're like, that's all I got to do. And I'm like, yeah, for right now, that's all you got to do. Pick seven. Bam, man, the focus is there. The attention is there. The motivation to get it done is there. The relationship is there. The, the creativity of which seven do I want, the discovery of why would I like one over the other, all of that is there now learning's fun again. And then we go do something else and maybe we come back and we do another seven. But um, for me on many days, if they get those first seven mostly right, we're done for the day. Right. I don't need, I don't need my kid to show me they can do 25. Right. right? What's the likelihood if they can do seven, bam, that all of a sudden the last seven, they're going to fail. Ah. Right. Yeah. And you have the extra ones in case they need it. And those, Absolutely. those can review, but if mm -hmm. they've got it in the first seven, there's no reason to go on. Yeah. And sometimes those extras are also additional earn opportunities. And we haven't really talked about this yet. 
Um, but I'm all about learn to earn as one of my early behavioral philosophies that I help parents learn, right? I don't know about you guys, but I go to work and I earn a paycheck <laughs> most days. Sometimes I work and I'm not earning quite yet, but the point is that I want to earn by going to work. So why would we not teach our kiddos that, right? So I go do something cool and I earn something cool. I go hug my husband and I get a kiss back. Right, I go make dinner and I get to eat something really cool that I really enjoy. I go finish my schoolwork and I earn recess time. I don't know, what, what, what does that look like? And so in homeschooling, sometimes we miss some of those built-in earn opportunities um, because maybe we don't have recess on the board. It's right, it's like we finish our, our three hours of homeschooling and then you have the whole rest of the day to play. But we're not pulling those earn opportunities into our learning day. Um, and I really think that we should, right? Um, and so, so what does that look like? We said, you know, we're gonna do this together. I pick an activity, you pick an activity. We're gonna start with math. You only have to do seven, be creative, pick your seven. And they say, well, I wanna earn extra recess, recess time, right? Recess is only 10 minutes today on our schedule. And I wanna earn 20 minutes. Or recess is not until, you know, number five is where it kind of ended up on our list of seven or eight things. What do you think about bringing it up to number three, Jenny? And I say, well, what do you think about earning it by doing five more of those math problems? And then the choice is theirs. I'm building independence. What do you want to do? Right? And we're talking it through. So we're doing relationship and we're doing some critical thinking over here. Is it worth it? Is it not worth it? Right? And they can say, yeah. And they can sit down and circle seven more and knock that out and bop that thing up two spaces on the schedule. And then they say to me, you know, Jenny, I picked, you know, for recess, we were going to go ride three times around the block on our bikes. I am really wanting to do that now before it gets hot. I'm like, oh, well, we're supposed to do two more activities before then. And they say, what if I did seven more math problems? <laughs> right. And now they're asking us to do these things. Right, because we've made it fun and we've made it creative and we've made it supportive. Um, so we spend a lot of time talking to families about their values and the difference between earning and bribing because I'm not about bribing, I'm, I'm yeah. about earning. My boss doesn't have to bribe me to go to work. Mm -hmm. She does have to bribe me to work overtime, <laughs> right? And that's why we get time and a half. But she doesn't have to bribe me to go to work because she set it up so that it's predictable and made it worth it to me to go to work. Um, and so, so helping families see where those earn opportunities are and to build that culture of, you know, it's good to work and it's good to earn and earning and learning to work get us, you know, lots of opportunities in our world. And what does that look like for a kindergartner versus a fourth grader versus, you know, an eighth grade middle schooler versus a 15, 16 year old, 10th, 11th grader who we're looking at sending out into the world in another year to go do life or college or whatever they're going to do. Um, so earn opportunities are another great environmental change and support that helps behavior change without me having to enforce rules or without me having to really teach a skill. It's really teaching motivation. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. So I, well, before I start, um, Lily, did, if you want, if you have a question or you want to jump in on anything that we're talking about, please feel free to unmute and let us know. Um, you're welcome to, to, um, hi. <laughs> hi. Thank you so much, uh, Jen, for the uh, emphasis on the family values and advocating for your uh, your children because uh, and believing in caregivers that they are really, really um, just valuable in the uh, care of, of your own children, right? Because yes. um, I am a I am a parent of uh, two young adults now, um, but they've struggled with. Uh, uh, not so much learning, um, but with definitely with motivation to learn. Uh, and that was due to their barriers of mental health um, mm -hmm. with anxiety and depression. And I uh, now I, I work in the field of mental health, working alongside with parents mm -hmm. and uh, really educating them uh, about um, 
like what you just you what you just said uh, as well. The values of your family is very individual, and working with that. And we also uh, focus a lot on the emotions of your child. Uh, we uh, we teach workshops on emotion focused family therapy and believing that the caregivers are the ones that spend 24 seven and I'm probably for the rest of their lives with yeah. you know their children and grandchildren and great grandchildren. And, and the whole fact is that the bottom line is that every human life, every human being wants connection and, and whether you have, you're on the spectrum or not, every human being that is created is, um, is going to experience emotions. And, and so, uh, you know, we try to uh, support parents to, teach how to validate their child's emotions, where they're at, uh, and also behavior coach them as they process that emotion. Like they're really unable to um, focus on that um, task because they're really emotionally ramped up. So how can we really validate that emotion and then bring them to a place where, okay, now let's shift, redirect and uh, follow through with, um, you know, maybe just getting out of bed, starting, you know, and I know school is really hard and validating all that experience and why are, why is it hard for them? And, and in the end of the day, in the whole overarching theme is connection that that yeah. child's like in a neuro, I mean, I'm sure you are all aware of this. It is evidence-based. It's a neurology that the primary caregiver has that impact on their um, neural pathway. Uh, the oxytocin is released once, once that parent uh validates that that emotion and that that uh that experience that they're having um so yeah i really appreciate that uh jen what you're saying that uh you go in there and you do do some detective work and and then then having the family just take on take it on and giving them the confidence to um to just really have that circle of care for their for their children so yes Mm -hmm. yes yeah the the parents have to feel like they are the experts. Now, being an expert parent doesn't make you an expert in everything, right? I might be an expert carpenter and I can build houses really well, but as a mechanic, I'm lacking, right? But if you're going to come talk to me, you've got to realize that I'm an expert carpenter and that that is massive when it comes to me trying to figure out how I'm going to do my business and help all of my workers get this job done. It's the same thing with our parents. We've got to validate them, like you said, that they are the experts on their kiddos when it comes to parenting. Now, if you want to talk about behavior change, right, being a mechanic, there might be some things that I can offer you. Or if you want to talk about being a dentist or reading better, there are some things that Rosemary and Sherry could probably offer you. But as far as who knows what's best for your kiddo, the parents have have got to feel like they can give that input on their children. And I feel like that's really been minimized, if not completely taken away. And and I don't wanna get off into a rabbit trail here, but in our public school systems um, and just in how parenting sometimes is, is viewed today that somebody else always knows better than you, right? And we're here to help you. And it's like, yeah, but but help me in a way that helps my family, not that makes me more like you, right? Because being more like Jenny is not my end goal. Jenny's kid is amazing. If you hang out with me for very long, you'll know how amazing my kid is because I can't help talking about my kid. But the goal is not for me to make Sherry's kid or Lily's kid or anybody else's kid like my kid. I want them to be awesome being your kid. And I can't do that if I don't understand where the parents are coming from. So yeah, that's, that's, that's just huge for us. Mm-hmm. That's just huge for us. So, so you any other- teach... You teach, um, you teach college students or tell us about like what you, this incredible opportunity that we have available to our Facebook group. Yes, absolutely. And um, I don't know, I've, I've got a link to a form that, that can get people plugged into this. So I'll tell you about it first. And then Sherry, you can tell me, or Rosemary, how you want me to get this information to your families. Um, But as a behavior analyst, when we go through school, we have to do clinicals, right? We all get our book work and then we have to go get our human work and and learn how to apply our book knowledge, just like a nurse would have clinicals or 
a teacher does student teaching. It's, it's the same type of thing. And so that's my current job. My current business right now is helping those students um, who are either fin finishing up their master's degree or they have a master's degree and they're adding on some additional classes and they're going to get certified to be a board certified behavior analyst. I help them with their clinicals. Well, that requires humans, <laughs> right? We have to have somebody to practice on somebody to take what we're learning and, and implement it on, take all of, all of these wonderful theories and ideas and, and our science of learning and try it out on somebody. And so most of my students are maybe special ed teachers or they work in the field of autism in a school somewhere. And so they have clients, but some of my folks don't. Um, they're, and they're not ready to quit their day job until they're certified. So we go on the hunt, if you will, for willing families who would like to be clients of my students for a short term. And so what we have to offer for your families, I believe, I believe it worked out to a six session family consultation. And so what that looks like is we have you guys fill out a form, have your parents fill out a form. They would tell us what their behavior of concern is, right? And it can be a concern that you need to have less of, right? Less temper tantrums, less screaming, less whatever. Or it could be a behavior that you need more of, right? More task completion, more independent work, more, um, I, I don't know, any, anything more that you would want. So, so we have a place for the parents to say, these are our three behaviors that we'd like to talk to you about. And then the students will come in, they'll do a parent interview, they'll ask you a thousand questions, right, to, to find out more about that behavior, more about your family values, more about the environment, more about what's working to support that goal that you have or, or not working to support that goal. Um, and then we will also do, so session one is that initial parent interview, and then we teach the parents how to take some basic data. Right, as behavior analysts, we are number crunchers. We love to be able to prove it that the program is working or not working and needs to be changed by looking at the, the numbers going up or down. So we teach the parents how to take some basic data. Um, and that's session number one, right? So we, we talk about those three behaviors. What do you want? Do you want to see them go up or down? And we talk, we talk to the parents about how to record what those behaviors look like. Then we come back a week later. Um, in the week later, we try and do a parent observation with the child, preferably in a time when that behavior of concern is happening or we'd like to see it happen, right? Because if I were gonna walk into your house, I would say, well, show me what that looks like, all right? Now we don't wanna trigger our kids into temper tantrums, but if we know that um, you know, math time is always when the temper tantrum or the hiding under the desk happens, then I'm gonna say, you know, hey parent, can we, see what that looks like to do math time. Now this is all over all over Zoom. Um, Lily, thank you for joining us, bye-bye. Um, so, so our second session would be an observation and then additional assessment that comes out of that observation where we really try and help the parents help us figure out why that might be happening. Then our third session would be um, a, parent re a parent meeting to review the assessment results and to discuss goals that we think would help get the child and the parent towards that family value of X, Y, or Z, right? Whatever, whatever it was that we've talked about. And then we actually train the parents on a little mini program to help them start moving in the direction of more, better, or less of what, whatever of those behaviors of concern that, that they want to see. So we teach the parent how to actually do something. Then they get a week or two weeks, depending on how much time they think they'll need to put this into practice. And we come back and we do another parent observation, right? So let's see, how are you doing? Show me math time again, right? Show me your data that you've collected. Is it working? Is it not working? Wow, that's great. Let's tweak it. Oh, that's really hard. Let's try something else. Mm -hmm. um, and so we, we try and do an observation again give them feedback on the data they've taken and on the goals that they've worked on and we tweak something else. Then session, what am I on? One, two, three, four, five would be another parent training on either how to do a next step 
or on something totally different. So like if we've really focused on like behavior number one of their behavior of concern number one, and we did a training, we did all of this around that behavior, then maybe we would go to behavior number two. Or if they say, wow, this is working great, but I'm also really interested in food selectivity, or I'm really interested in bedtime routines, or I'm really interested, then we have opportunity for one more parent training that's just kind of information-based. And then our last, our next session would be a repeat, right? Let's watch you do it. Let's see how it's going. Let's look at your data. Let's tweak your program. Let's yay raw, see what we need to fix, totally revamp. And then our last session would be kind of discharge planning. Now, it doesn't mean that they've arrived, but it means that we've probably gotten to the end of the time that the students have to come and work with them. And so we say, so what are they supposed to do next? How do you know when to keep doing this? How do you know when to change something? So I think it works out to one, two, three, four, five, six, seven sessions. And the sessions are roughly two hours a piece. And so this is what we're offering to your families for free to kind of help them, give them a taste of what ABA can do as far as learning science goes um, and help our help my students out to be able to have some interaction with a family within a time limited, we have a plan, this is what we hope to accomplish. I can't give you five years of my time, but I can definitely give you this. Um, and really, again, just give your, your families a place to say, wow, if I could just have somebody give me a little input on how to tweak this little thing that's not working, that would be amazing. Well, here's that opportunity. Yeah. So if your families want to, to get involved in this, um, I'll, again, I'll give you a disclaimer. Um, we'll give you a form to fill out that we can post in your Facebook group. Your families will fill it out. It'll send me an email. Just because you fill out the form doesn't mean you get to come do the consultation. Because when we look at the behavior of concerns, I have to be able to match that up with the skills of my college students. And so if currently, if none of my college students are good with feeding issues, right? My kid only wants to eat macaroni, but culturally we need to get them to eat cheese and rice. And that's really important to the social aspect and relational aspect of our family. But I don't have any of my students that, that have progressed to, to that level of their skills yet. Then I'm gonna say, man, can I keep you on my waiting list for when my next cohort of students come in and I get somebody that is, is really better at working on this? Then, then can we talk? So just because they fill out the form doesn't guarantee them access to the, the program, yeah. but it's the place that, that we start is by finding out what their needs are and, and then trying to match them up with our students. How often do you get a new set of co cohort? Or a new Quarterly. 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 So about every three to four months. Nice. Yeah. Is it through a university that is... Or it is through me reaching out to folks on Facebook and answering questions and helping students who are not getting their supervision someplace else. Um, it's, it's really a matchup game. Um, not everybody likes Jenny. I know you find that really hard to believe. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's kind of like finding your, your health care provider, right? Not everybody likes the same doctor. Not everybody likes the same you know, CPA, not everybody likes the same lawyer. We want good results, but we also want somebody that we can work with. Um, so I do a lot to reach out to students, help them know what good supervision looks like. And then the ones who go, wow, Jenny is like really cool and awesome. And I want to learn from her for the next year and a half to two years. Then they come to me and, and get in, into my cohorts. So do you have opportunities for families then? If families wanted to learn more about ABA, do you do have any kind of a, something to like that? I'm just curious, but. Well, if my friends Sherry and Rosemary invite me back <laughs> with a specific topic, then we could definitely talk about that because that's another thing that my students do is they develop parent trainings. Um, and we typically develop those parent trainings just based off of our curriculum right? You're going to teach a parent how to help their kid learn how to request for what they want. So let's do a parent training on, on functional communication training, right? How do you get your kiddo to ask for things better? And so if that's important to your families, we'd love a platform to come share that information. Um, so that's kind of a yes, and I don't know, and not yet, but we're working on it kind of answer. Okay. 
and we really tailor it to the needs, right? So if somebody calls me up and says, hey, can you talk to us about making visual schedules? Then yeah, let's get together and do an hour. I'll tell you what your materials list will be and you guys show up with your stuff and we show up and talk about why visual schedules work, how you use them. Same thing with like token systems, right? You earn five stars and it's break time. There's a lot of science that goes into that token system and you can make it crash really fast if you're not following some of the steps. If you have families that wanna know how do I use gold stars to motivate my kid, then great, let's set up an hour and, and we'll come in and give you training on that. Um, so we, we really try and base it off of family needs or parent needs or whoever invites us. It's like, what do you want us to talk about? Because our, our science works really well across the board. We've just got to figure out if it's something that we already have a training developed on or if I've got to put my students on developing something and then we come and present it for you. Awesome. Mm -hmm. That's great. So homeschool families out there, if you're thinking about something and you're wondering, wow, I wonder how changing the environment or I wonder how thinking about this differently as a, a values based drill instead of, you know, learn the task or, you know, any of those things, post those under this video once Sherry and Rosemary post it to the Facebook group and let us know what your thoughts and interests are because yeah. we'd love to keep disseminating information and knowledge and, and, different ideas for you guys for sure yeah. thank you so much sir, uh jenny for um this coming in again and uh, taking your time to join us today and this is you have such fascinating uh topics that uh, we are so thrilled to learn more and uh, share you as a resource um, yes in our facebook group we just really appreciate that thank you so much for coming today Yes, you are so sure. welcome. Absolutely. Did we have any questions in the Facebook group that people are wanting? No. no. Okay. We have a few people watching. Awesome. All right. Well, if anybody has any questions, um, but I think you can put them in and then we'll figure out if that's a new topic or, um, mm -hmm. or another opportunity or where to go from there. So. But yes, thank you so much, Jenny. Thank you for taking the time to spend with us. We really appreciate it. And, and uh, your dedication to families is definitely um, very obvious. So we appreciate yeah. you. Yeah, what absolutely. You're doing for homeschooling families and have been doing yeah. for many, many years. So that's awesome. Yeah, many years. Yeah, absolutely. You guys are so welcome. Thanks again for having me today. Of course. Okay. All right. Well, you guys have an amazing evening and we will see you guys next time. All right. Yay. Bye.